Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Michael. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so we're going to have to stop calling each other Michael because it will become very repetitive, right? <laughs> It uh, might. It's been a while since I've had a Michael on the podcast, so it makes a nice change. Thank you. Of course. You're welcome. Thank you. So I already mentioned in our preamble, I'm really curious about the picture in your background. Obviously, our audio listeners can't hear it, so we'll describe it to them later um, because I saw it on your LinkedIn profile in the in your banner image. And so I'm really curious to learn more about that. So. I will remember to ask you if you want to mention it, but I'm sure you will. Yes. And um, to get us going into your story, um, please tell us a little bit about where you were born, where did you go to school, what kind of education did you have, your first job, how did the career progress, did indeed you have a career, maybe you went straight into working for yourself. That happens too with a lot of people. And um, yeah, and then we'll get into current day and, and find out what you're up to. So over to you, Michael. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, I live in the United States and I was raised in West Michigan. Uh, and so the first uh, 23 years of my life were spent in a very small town in West Michigan. There were 2,500 residents in this small town. Wow. And back in 1953, my grandfather started our family's landscaping, lawn maintenance, and snow plowing business. So from age 12 until 24, all I did was cut grass, shovel dirt, and go to school, right? That was my wow. life <laughs> for, for many years. And, uh, and that was a blessing in some ways. I learned some really important values about integrity and about customer service and about hard work, but also challenging in other ways because uh, there were feelings of emotional abandonment. There were feelings of being like a robot inside the family business. Uh, yeah. There were feelings of desiring for something more, but not knowing how to get them, if you will. Mm, yes. So in 2003, I uh, ended up getting married and we decided to move to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where I live, live currently. And yeah. so for the first probably five years that we were here together, there were a lot of things happening with regards to us um, moving from these very small towns in West Michigan to starting to live in a very big city and working mm. in the hospitality industry. So I worked at the Four Seasons Resort uh, for a oh. number of years, which was great. I got to meet some cool people. I got to interact with folks from around the world. Uh, yes. I got to learn about customer service at a really deep level. Uh, and you know, so there were cool things that came out of that experience. But during that time, I was also going through the process of uh, my relationship with my ex-wife really wasn't that great, right? Mm -hmm. So it ultimately came to a head at the middle part of 2008, where uh, we were both really heavily involved in our work. Uh, and yes. then I found out one Friday that she was going to leave me. And so we ended up over you know, the next couple of weeks going through the process of a divorce. But the, the saving grace inside of that weekend where my wife left me, lost the money, lost the house, was the Monday morning after that discussion, uh, I started an MBA program at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Wow. And so it was a really heavy weekend uh, emotionally, right? Because you, you think you're coming to this new state to start this new life with this person and start a family. And then all of a sudden, some of those dreams and some of those things are no longer true. Yeah. So had to start from scratch that Monday morning and say, what is it that I'm really going to do with my life? And thankfully, as a first year MBA student, I was given a career coach. And if it wasn't for this woman, Pam, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And so really? I think we all have those angels that come into our life. And Pam was definitely that for me, because as a first year student, she was asked to help me design resumes, design my cover letter, you know, really say, what is Michael's personal brand? And how are we going to sell that to prospective employers? Yes. And that process was so immensely meaningful for me because I had been a robot in my family's business all those years. Yeah. And, and now Pam was teaching me how to be authentic. And I had no idea what that was like. So she kept offering suggestions about, here's your communication style. Here's what motivates you. Here's your values. Here's your strengths. These all lead towards, 
human resources. They lead towards leadership. They lead towards coaching and consulting. And I was at such a dark place emotionally that I was mm. kind of rejecting what it was that she was saying. Of course. Yeah. So once we got to be in our second year, so as a second year MBA student, she offered me as part of the career management center, a chance to coach first year students on the same process that she coached me on. Right. And that is where my life changed. So this was about 2009. And that's where my life really transformed because I would be in these coaching sessions with these first year students. And there were students from 53 different countries represented in the student body. Right. And Having been raised in this very homogeneous environment in West Michigan, this was quite shocking to me because I thought far more expansively than I ever had before. And I just realized that I got into flow really easy. I lost track of time when I was in those coaching sessions with these other students. And then that set me down the path of saying, maybe coaching and mentoring and consulting, counseling, you know, whatever those things are, I think I need to do something like that for my career. So, okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you there for yeah. a second so pam did she actually teach you coaching or did you just see her in action and then took those skills that you saw her in action you copied her and used those that knowledge onto those first year students definitely yeah that was more right. so the case was emulating her style because it for some reason really deeply resonated with me Got you. Yeah. So you basically, it's like watching somebody cook in the kitchen, right? You just cop, cop, copy the cook uh, or the baker or whatever, and then yeah. use the same recipe on other people. Yeah. That yeah. is the best way to learn. Yeah. Brilliant. I agree. And thank you for stopping me there because that's an important point is that yeah. uh, she didn't teach me how to coach. There were, of course, little elements here or there that she did guide me through, but yeah. really it was about emulating her style. And then as I got more safe with doing it, then I started to incorporate my own style. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, when you think about, you know, then uh, I kind of followed the herd and uh, I got a job at a very large healthcare system in HR as the director of talent sourcing. So my role was to help with employee referral program, the career transition program, new employee orientation, the entire onboarding process for the 27,000 yes. employees. And I also had a small team and a, a pretty big budget to be able to source really hard to fill roles. Yes. But in those two years of working in that corporate role, I was really struggling because I wasn't coaching, right? I was, mm -hmm. I was leading this team and I had the money and I had the power, I had the house, I had the car, I had all these things, but it yes. was really unfulfilling. Right, and right. so in February, 2011, I made a promise to myself that I was going to find a way to get out of corporate and start my own practice as a coach. Oh. So. So I worked through the process in the kind of spring, summer, and early fall of 2011 to then start my business in October of 2011. So I quit working for the corporate entity full-time October 2011 and transitioned yeah. into running my business that it exists now uh, part-time because I, I wasn't able to launch my business in a way that I had a, a slew of customers coming to me. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I ended up supplementing that income by teaching classes at a local university and then picking up uh, jobs as to work as a career or executive coach at another local university just to make sure that I could take risks inside of my own business. I could really grow and build my business nights and weekends in a way that was meaningful for me. So yeah, that's really smart because um, just, to, just to interject there, I did it wrong when I started my business. You know, I, I didn't have anything to fall back on if it failed and it wasn't comfortable. Let's put it that way. We're financially very, very tough. And uh, yeah, there's still uh, there's still evidence of that around me. But to to start your own business whilst you're still, you know, doing something else is a smart way. But you also have to be incredibly motivated because you could say oh, okay it's just easier to go and get a job and just stay with that job and put all my effort into that that other thing you know so you must have really wanted it um yeah oh that's the truth so mm -hmm. after having worked for in the family business all those years 
and then having worked at the Four Seasons Resort, which was a, a tremendous experience, but it was also very challenging because of the time I had to give. And then yeah. working inside that corporate organization, that was also very challenging for me emotionally because I was working 60 plus hours a week and I was yes. making yeah. good money, but there, I, I also lost control right in that mm. way. And so yeah. the motivation that you're describing definitely came from me not wanting to go back to an environment where I was not in control. Yeah. And so I had all of those years of experiences of not being in control and feeling like a robot and not being able to be authentic that I promised myself that no matter what, I was going to put in the effort to be able to be authentic. And so to your point, it took three years of nights and weekends building the business and the brand to the point that I could actually formally transition to do it full time. So right. in you know, so 2012, 2013, 2014, slowly building the business, but still working for these other organizations in the same type of capacity, right? Still working as a coach, still speaking publicly, still yes. helping people. So I was building my skill set. But then thankfully, at the beginning of 2015, um, I was able to transition to be able to do my business full time. And mm -hmm. but that took a lot of sacrifice, right? It took a lot of nights and weekends of hard work where I wasn't doing the things that I would have necessarily enjoyed doing. So those, let's say three years of hard work and or sacrifice of time after 2015 opened up a lot of doors and freedoms that I would have not have otherwise had. Yeah. And so that's an important reminder for everybody is that we're moving to a time in human history where the gig economy or project work or entrepreneurship is kind of the status quo. Yes. And the first couple of years of it are challenging. Don't get me wrong, but it also creates an incredible amount of control, right? You get to do whatever you want, whenever it is that you want it. Yeah. And, but it also requires an internal drive and motivation to keep going, even when things seem bleak. Yeah. And that's, that's really important. So at the beginning of 2015, uh, so basically now for the last six years, I've been working as an executive coach and the, right. the business has evolved a little bit throughout time. It first started out as resume writing and cover letters and interview support. And then yes. it became, I'm certified to use the disc assessment, uh, which you posted yes. on your website. So uh, I was looking at that. So I've got some insight into you, Michael, if you ever want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, doing communications training and communications coaching, and then that kind of morphed into 2017, 2018, where I was doing some more personal branding and executive coaching around branding for executives. Yes. Yeah, and then all yeah. of a sudden that morphed into 2018, 19, and 20, where I was working with organizations and changing their corporate culture. Right. And, and so now in this last year, the business has been, of course, executive coaching, of course, public speaking, of course, organizational change consulting. But I also, at the beginning of 2021, published a book. And so my focus has been a little bit on uh, leading, leading conversation around the book. And so in April of 2021, we launched what's referred to as the You and I Know Circle, which is a, okay. a reading group, a mastermind, a coaching circle, where 12 basically CFOs from around the United States have come together to meet every other week to talk about the concepts of the book, but also to grow and develop themselves and one another. So yeah. when I look at my business, there's been lots of little transformations, but the core has always been executive coaching because when I was young, I was a robot inside my family's business mm. or working inside those other businesses. Yes. Pam in you know that early kind of 2008, 2009 timeframe yes. taught me authenticity. And now through a very a different kind of set of means, I help others become the most authentic version of themselves. And that's really meaningful for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's brilliant because it's, there is nothing better than having had an experience yourself and a transformation to then be able to assist others with a similar transformation because you come from a place of empathy and understanding where they're at. Now, the difficult thing, of course, is no, no, none of us can actually tell people exactly what they've got to do. They've got to, you as a coach can't say, well, if you just do this, then all your problems will go or you'll be an authentic leader. Then you, you've got to help them with some insights, uh, discover that journey. And what I like is, is these guys helping each other through the book as well. That's, I genuinely haven't, I'm sure there are other people doing it and you may have got the idea from other people, but um, 
it's been a while since I've heard somebody do something, you know, where it's a kind of a collective that are mastermind groups aren't new, but using a book to do that with that's that's new to me anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. It, so this is the thing is that society is going through this really big transformation right now. And yeah. as we're kind of navigating these transformations, it's, it's hard. And I really love what you said a second ago, Michael, it's that as we navigate these transformations, people like you and I as coaches can't just give the answer to someone else. They have to discover it for themselves yes. through yeah. mistakes made through experiential learning through some other means. So we can plant the seed or prime them psychologically for, Hey, this is coming or Hey, consider this, but they have to have the experience that engages their five senses that they then experience the transformation emotionally for themselves. And then yeah. their next steps will be different as a result. And that's where the you and I know circle I'm trying to capitalize on that is that we've made this transformation on earth really recently in the last 10 years from a place of really uh, like having a tribal mindset where mm. the vast majority of people believed that their personal meaning came from association with some other brand, right? To a not-for-profit, to a particular company, to a particular sports team or hobby, uh, to a specific religion, right? We uh, found our personal meaning in attaching to some external party, deity, belief system, celebrity, athlete, politician, fill in the blank, right? Yes. And now yes. all of a sudden, over the last 10 years, there's been this really uh, quick uh, disintegration of those hierarchical systems. And now we're ramping up into this idea that meaning comes from us as individuals. What is our life's mission? What is our purpose? What are the things that we came to earth to experience and do? Mm -hmm. And so before we used to emulate the celebrity or the politician or the athlete. And now what we see is this decentralization where we're now having conversations with a lot of other people like us and taking their perspective or ideas and then trying to incorporate it into our own lives to help, help facilitate our own change. So this transformation has been hard, but what it's taught us is, is that we can't just take someone else's perspective and just emulate that. We have yes. to take all of these disparate data sources from these other people and make different conscious, intentional choices for what's right for us as individuals. Yeah. So what, where do you think or where has that philosophy or that knowledge you have about this past 10 years transformation, where, how has that come about for you? Where, where, is that something that you have felt inherently or something you've witnessed or someone has taught you? I'm interested to know about this 10 year, last 10 year shift thing. Yeah. The, so I think in 2011, as I was really starting to consider the transformation of my life away from working for others to uh, really doing my own thing and what that was going to look like, spent a lot of time on the web and a lot of time talking to other entrepreneurs right. to say, what does this look like? Right? How, how can I expect to feel? Right? What am I going to have to change about my life, my daily habits and routines and rituals to make mm. this happen? Mm. And a couple of the people said something about Michael, you have to pay attention to astrology or numerology. And that was something that I had never really spent a lot of time with before, but then slowly 2011, 2012, 2013 started to dive into a little bit more. And then as time passed and progressed, followed specific websites, followed specific social profiles about those things and tried to slowly integrate it into my life. And then in, in right. the latter part of 2017, I started to see a Reiki master an energy healer, and I had some executive coaches. And those, the, the combination of those different perspectives from traditional executive coaching to having a Reiki master work on my energy specifically to then working mm -hmm. with another energy healer to just help me process emotions and what's happening in my body differently. Mm -hmm. That was really the thing that helped me to start to dive into and say, okay, why are these changes on earth actually occurring? Right. So yes. Um, we heard about this in 2011 and 2012 with, you know, the Mayan calendar predicts the end of the world is coming in 2012. That was not what was happening, right? There was yeah. what that was, is that the Mayan calendar stopping in 2012 was the end of something called the age of Pisces. And so right. the end of 2012 moving into 2013 was the beginning of the age of Aquarius, which is where kind of energetically where we live today. Yes. And so having these people kind of teach me what this meant the underlying energy that was kind of driving the transformation on earth. 
it helped me to understand these changes at a deeper level to say, now I can kind of understand why these transformations are occurring. Here's what might occur down the road for people, right? That they mm -hmm. don't yet know. Right. And so in chapter two of my book, I tried to dive into my beliefs around we're making this transformation from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. Here are the possible transformations and changes. Here's what you can do to get ready if they do occur. Right. So really what it was, was, you know, just a serendipitous being introduced to the idea of astrology to then a couple of years later saying, Hey, I need to talk to a Reiki master or an energy healer and also talk to executive coaches to get this perspective. But then it was just desire or interest on my behalf to take the time mm -hmm. to learn about it through podcasts and through articles and through talking to yeah. others. And that has really helped me to look at the world differently than maybe some other folks in society do. It's, it's fascinating. And, you know, they say there are no accidents. Um, so my journey of awakening also started with Reiki. And I had a, uh, I was in the textiles industry for many years working for corporates. And I was on an airplane, just a very quick story, give you time to breathe. Um, uh, I was on a on a on a plane traveling to New York with uh, my designer, and um, we were going to see Victoria's Secrets to show our next collection of fabrics for them to use in their in their garments. And I had some issues going on emotionally, mentally, physically as well. And then she said something. Reiki, blah blah blah, and kinesiology. Right, these two words, and I went what are you talking about? It's just like, you might as well talk Chinese right now. I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And because I had these really bad headaches and she then gave me some Reiki and they disappeared. And to cut a long story short, when my kind of, you know, uh, let's call it a foundation crumbled, um, I had my first Reiki healing session by her because she then set up as a Reiki master um, was an incredible experience in terms of, you know, I mean, literally just explosion of emotion and tears and God knows what else. So, and I'm really fascinated because you're an executive coach and you're writing about this in your book and executive coaches, uh, executives are actually reading this and having to talk about it in their circles. And I find that incredible. Well done to you for getting it into the corporate world <laughs> and for people to start thinking about energy and yeah, incredible. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for saying that. It, uh, th there was a lot of fear for me, 2017, 2018, 2019, to discuss these mm -hmm. things openly. I mean, definitely yes. there was a fear because yes. society, it do does, does society allow for it? Does it not? And mm -hmm. so I would oftentimes in those particular days refer to these concepts through the lens of emotional intelligence or through the lens of yes. personal branding. So yes. I would couch it by saying, you know, I would, I would share resources and insights and beliefs that were like 80% things that they would normally find in society. So it didn't seem weird. And then I would slowly 10 or 20% start to introduce these ideas of astrology and numerology, energy, Reiki masters. And so it was, it was couched in a very safe way to allow for mm. them to slowly over time absorb it. Mm. And, and so thankfully now, you know, since uh, basically May of 2019, I talk about May of 2019 and the, the kind of the introduction of the book, uh, yeah, because good. I had gotten to a really deep place in my life that I was actually contemplating suicide. And I was mm -hmm. like, Hey, you know, this relationship that I had for six years is gone. My stepdaughter is off to college. So I'm an empty nester. These things in my business that I was trying weren't working because they were actually misaligned with my true path in life, but I couldn't see it at the time. So in May of 2019, you know, I was going through this process of really significantly struggling, wanting to commit suicide, wanting to leave earth. So had those moments and went back to see the energy healer and she helped to clear out some really strong energies that were in my root and sacral chakras. And yes. so once those were gone, the feelings of desire to leave earth, they left too, thankfully. So then I right. spent the, the, that summer of 2019, really kind of coming back to the basics and saying, 
I tried these things in my business. They weren't working. How can I find a better niche? How can I find a better time? How can I really share authentically my journey, but help find those niches of individuals that really mm-hmm. want this? And it was at that point, Michael, that I said, I need to start talking about astrology more. I need to talk about energy more because yeah. I was not necessarily being truly completely authentic in 2017, 2018, and early 2019. And I think that's what led to my feelings of despair. So then I just decided I'm just going to start sharing these things far more openly because I feel that's more aligned with my life's work this time on earth. And so that I think has been part of the the acceptance of my message, right? Is that I share the journey very holistically throughout each chapter of my book, Mm -hmm. but there have been people that have you know, very, very influential people in society that have sent me emails saying, Hey, I've experienced this too. I've been thinking about this too, but I didn't feel safe to talk about it societally. And so by me putting it out and then having influential people send me a message back saying, I agree with this, but I don't feel safe to talk about it. Mm -hmm. That was the trigger for me to say, it is now time to launch a circle, right. And to start to get these people involved. And so now after four months of leading the first circle, because there were nine sessions in the first one, these 12 individuals have now shared their respective stories with their companies and their circles of influence and all this. And so now it's slowly growing, but I, I needed to authentically share myself first and the things that were a little bit different or unique to then allow for others to be attracted to me that now the message is being shared more broadly. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. It's, it's incredible because, um, the, 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 picture I get because I'm I mean the podcast is called share your story I am very interested in the concept of storytelling that's why I get my guests to tell their story Um, I think storytelling works in business in society in general and the picture I have of the circle is these these executives women men sitting around a campfire you know, sharing their stories of woe and success and their next steps and how all of this new knowledge is coming to them and they're waking up. Um, yeah. I, so that's the mental image I created in my head as you're describing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, in a, in a virtual sense, that's what we attempted to create. <clears throat> and so yeah. You know, we were reaching out to a number of people. We were blasting this idea out to a lot of different circles. Uh, We were able to get 12 executives to come back and say, yes, I want to be a part of this. And Mm -hmm. so in those introductory emails and saying, hey, please read the book first so that you understand who I am and what I think about. And they Mm -hmm. did. And then so each meeting that we had was it was first off a celebration of wins. What have you done in the last couple of weeks that you're really proud of connected to the book or not? And then I would talk for five or 10 minutes about here's a behind the scenes look at the resources and the story and the idea of this particular chapter. Yeah. And then I always had six kind of discussion questions that we, I could ask the, the participants and then they could talk about freely or openly. And then I would always close with, hey, here are the things I'm going to consider. I want you to consider doing in the next couple of weeks for your own, for your own action, for your own growth, or reach out to another member to be able to have discussion with them. So every meeting was structured very intentionally to celebrate wins, to give a behind the scenes look at my life or the story in that chapter, and then to have them basically release the details of kind of that same place in their life, right? So they were telling their story and people could hear it from one another so they could feel safe to do so. So Mm. the fun part about that was, is that we had these really structured meetings that were intended to be 60 minutes in length but almost every single call turned into a two hour phone call Wow! (laughs) because because people were so interested in telling their story or hearing other stories because nowhere in society were they really talking about the emotional release or the connection to astrology or how do they define their personal brand? Because they just didn't have people in their sphere of influence to talk about that stuff. Yes. So the, the you and I know circle created that environment that allowed for them to truly be themselves authentically and to share as much of their story as they felt called to in that moment. And then they've continued to grow from that point, which makes me feel tremendous. And, and how did you come up with the title, the you and I know circle? So the the book is called, I know. Right. Okay. So here's, you can see if you're watching video, you can see this, this copy of the book. So the book is called, I know. And, and I really, I really liked 
you know, kind of the model that Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant had come up with years ago uh, with regards to lean in. And there are things uh, she wrote that book called lean in. And yeah. so I went to the lean in website to learn a little bit about the circles that they had created. And, right. and I really liked the model and how they structure things. And so I tried to emulate some of those aspects, but it just came to me, honestly, Michael, and this is silly, but the idea the book I had the, the name probably two years ago, I knew that I would write the book and I knew what the title would be. I just had wow. to have the courage to be able to do it. Uh, and then the the name for the you and I know circle, it just randomly came while I was in the shower. And like, these <laughs> are the things <laughs> I was just showering one day and I was thinking about the circle and I was like, what's a good name? Cause we were kind of debating what the name of the circle might be. Yes. And then all of a sudden the, the, the idea you and I know came, right? So it, it just is this belief that the person reading the book in his or her heart knows the answer. But then around the circle, the other person, in this case, you also knows, right? So it's just this belief that all of life's answers to our most difficult or, or big problems are inside of us. All we need to do is sit in meditation or stillness and trust our intuition that we have the answers. So the you and I know circle came out of believing that every single person had the answers inside themselves. It was just us creating that safe place for each individual to express him or herself meaningfully. Yeah. There, there, that's really genius. There is another angle which came up for me, which you probably will have seen or maybe not. I don't know. I'll share it with you. And that is you and I know our stories, right? Because every human story is the same. We all have the same story. So therefore, you and I know <laughs> that we're living the same story. You know, we know our stories. That's why people are so interested. And that's why your calls are going on for two hours, because they're listening to stories that they can relate to. They're yeah. hearing someone's story and going, that's me. <laughs> I have yeah. the same thing going on because yeah. you've just what well, you've just shared. Yeah. Um, so it's that's why it's so appropriate i believe uh yeah i love the title of the circle and i love the title of the book i think yeah. it's it's very very good indeed so what's what's the big well it doesn't have to be big but what is your kind of vision do you have a vision for how you see this progressing so there are what i like conceptually at a societal level this transition into the age of Aquarius is going to move most of humanity away from very central hierarchical kind of power structures. And so we're going to see what I believe is going to be kind of the destruction of the things that we have hold have held true, right? Uh, like in many cases, big government or very, very large corporations that have multinational reach, um, people really, really, truly associating with specific sports teams, uh, you know, connected to football, both in America and in, in Europe. Some of those things are going to start to disintegrate because mm -hmm. people won't care so much about um, the, the meaning that they derive from being a part of that club or being a fan or uh, following some specific political party. I think that those structures are disintegrating right before our eyes today, and they wow. will even more. Wow. So. So I almost can't wait for that. To happen. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, we're watching it in real time, Michael, it's happening in front of us. It's hard to yeah. watch, right? Because we're yes. watching the things that we've held to be true kind of to dissolve, honestly. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's difficult, but it's also going to trigger this very, very huge awakening. What I believe is going to happen is, is that as these, as these structures dissolve, it will decentralize power. It will decentralize decision-making. It will decentralize how we find meaning in our lives. Yeah. And so what I see coming is, is that as this decentralization occurs, we're going to move more traditionally into like a gig economy or a project-based economy, or the vast majority of people who desire to work will work because they're motivated to do so on projects right. that are connected to their core values or to their life's purpose. Yeah. So we won't work just to make money. We will work on a project that's really interesting because it's meaningful for us or it advances our community. Yeah. Like that'll that'll change. And so what I think is going to happen is, is that something like the you and I know circle plugs in really well short term as society is making this transformation because mm -hmm. the book is designed to walk people through nine processes so that they really get to know themselves. 
So what I hope occurs is that I find a way to get the UNI Know Circle to grow to lots of different places and countries so that individuals like you or me, right, who are leading discussion, who are leading this idea of storytelling and sharing our respective journeys, that more people can use the processes within this book at a very local level. So oh, how could fine. how could Michael S. Seaver find a hundred people in fifty different countries that wanted to lead a U and I know circle, and that started people thinking more holistically about themselves, right, in a really right. deep and meaningful way? So I'm working behind the scenes to grow the U and I know circle to make it a very easily repeatable process for anybody in the world who wants to be able to use it for them to be able to use it, right? So that's what's going to happen at some point in the next twelve to eighteen months. Okay, so. Right. We see this decentralization, and what I'm trying to do is des design this kind of grassroots uprising or empowerment of people using the processes in the book. And the book, the way that I designed it was um, the old William Bridges model of transition, right? There's always three phases of transition. So the first three chapters are about how do you end and let go? So how do you overcome loss? How do you release fear? How do you emotionally release stuff that you've been holding on to? Yes. So then- when you get into the second three chapters, it's about being in an, an emotional neutral zone where you experiment. So what's your personal brand? What's your level of emotional intelligence? How do you share your brand with the world? Mm -hmm. Right. So then the third section is very much about how are we now implementing and planning and really living these new beginnings? So it's more about how do we share our brand inside of a workplace? And then how do we lead and engage team? And how do we become a coach to coaches? So yes. What I want people through reading the book, listening to the book, or, or, or being a part of a you and I know circle is to go from that place of disengagement or unhappiness or wonderment or fear. And if, yes. they, if they walk through telling their story or reading the book, by the end of it, by the end of a you and I know circle, if you will, they feel clear, they feel empowered, they feel like mm -hmm. they know what their brand or mission is, they know what their core values are, they know what their goals are or focus areas so that their habits and routines and rituals are aligned with what matters to them. And yes. this all goes back to what we said when we first started, is that I just really want people to live as authentically as they possibly can. And so yes. that's what I think is coming. And that's what I'm trying to help people do through the book and through the You and I Know Circle. Great vision. I, I love it. And yeah, I mean, you would need to, I guess, if you're moving it out to other countries, you would need because you couldn't be everywhere, could you? Um, so you need to train some people to be able to facilitate that, uh, to be your ambassador, does ambassadors for you, for your organization, who, you know, inherently get it. I mean, you know, lots of people that are doing it with similar types of um, outcomes, you know, look at somebody that, that comes to mind, say Byron Katie, I don't know if you know Byron Katie, you know, she does it worldwide. Uh, she's not getting any younger. So she has to get other people to, um, to adopt some of the approaches that she uses herself. And yeah, and she gives people the tools to be able to do that. Uh, you know, and the training and everything. So yeah, so I can perceive you're going to be, well, you are a training organization anyway, but you're, you're kind of will morph into a training organization as well <laughs> as, yeah. as as running these circles yourself. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And it's exciting. You know, after having, you know, worked as an executive coach for just over 10 years, a uh, lot of experiences, a lot of learnings, even you for yourself have talked about a little bit, right? There's a lot of things that you've even gone through and experienced. So yes, a, yes. as a result of having all these experiences, I just feel it's time to take, if it's the next generation or if it's at a person who's ready to go through their awakening, um, I really just want to give them the tools to be able to do so in their own way, right? And yeah. for me, it's not so much about franchising or it's not so much about creating certificate programs. I really yeah. want them to do it in the way that is appropriate for them. So I'm not sure exactly how I'll license or sell the model, mm -hmm. but I really want people to have really inexpensive access to it because yes. it's one of those things where uh, if there's if there's this grassroots uprising and a person has an opportunity to kind of take and morph the information in a way that's really important for them, they're going to be much more motivated to deliver it, right? And so I think that in this decentralized world that's coming, I want yeah. people to say, hey, here's the core, the base of knowledge, use what you feel is appropriate for you. 
and you can discard the rest, but do what's right for you as you're pushing your circle, as you're helping your circle, as you're guiding the members within your circle. So mm-hmm. I don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but I feel called to do it. And I feel really excited about it. Now it's just a matter of putting the right pieces into place to allow for it to roll itself out. Yeah. I'm sure you will find the answers. They'll probably come in the shower at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. And, and what else is going on apart from that? That's enough, but is there something else that's going on as well? <laughs> so, you know, with all of the changes that we see happening uh, on earth, right? With my predictions around, hey, the this kind of centralized hierarchical structures are going to dissipate. Uh, I think healthcare is going to change, especially in Western countries. We're going to move away from allopathic medicine to something that's a little bit more quantum based or something that's a little bit more homeopathic. So Mm. uh, I'm seeing the way that we learn is different. I think there's some people in society that really genuinely want to use virtual reality and other things that are technology based, but I think we're going to kind of gravitate a little bit away from that and go back to things like meditation and prayer where we can learn from ourselves, right? Just sitting in meditation and finding that. So I think there's going to be some transitions, not only with how do we work, you know, what's the healthcare system look like? How is it that we learn as humans or how do we kind of, uh, you know, come together in groups and, you know, I look at all those things and I don't know exactly when they're going to change, but the very beginning stages, they're here. Like we're experiencing them. If you just turn on the news any day, you see that they're there. And I think that's why, and I'll mention the painting behind me, Michael, because, yes. and that's why I kind of do what I do. And so for those of you who can't see, if you're just listening right behind me, there is a painting and it's of a, a lion's head and there's a body of water, like an ocean. And there's also a, a sun kind of rising out of the water. And then there's a series of feathers that kind of come out of the lion's hair. Now, a couple of years back, I did a barter transaction with an artist named Sarah. And so Sarah, I gave her an executive coaching package. And in exchange, she painted this four by six foot canvas behind me. Wow. So it's very large. Um, but what she did, and I didn't realize it, was is that somehow or another through her meditation, she picked up that my spirit animal is a lion. And then she intentionally painted the lion to look like me. So the eyes are blue. The cheekbones are pronounced. I have a beard. So the facial hair is there from the lion's mane. My hair is a little bit longer on top. And so the hair on the top of the lion is a little bit scraggly. So she wanted to parlay me, Michael, into the lion to say, Michael, you are a lion. This is your spirit animal. This is what you're meant to live. And so what I hope that people get from this is that when we think about what's coming in society, we're all going to be able to discover things about ourselves that we didn't know even five years ago. So I just want people to be very open to that because 10 years ago, I didn't think that having a lion spirit animal was even a possibility, right? (laughs) (laughs) And now I look at my life every day through the lens of, I have this lion spirit animal energy. How can I live that, right? How can I navigate and uplift others? How can I be responsible for and take care of the underserved in society? Right. So I think about the impact of these things in ways that I never did before. And I want to give others the safe place to do the same for themselves. That's really, really interesting. And I've I've been studying a lot about our conditioned minds and which are conditioned from a very, very young age. What what you are doing, what's coming to me is that what you're doing through that painting and the spirit animal that you are relating to is you're reconditioning your neurons in your mind along that route. You know, so all the things you said you want to become or maybe you are already now is through reconditioning. Um, because you had that conditioned robot years ago when you were younger and slowly and surely you're, you're, you know, you're reconditioning your mind, which is, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, I hadn't thought about that before. It's, it's just another interesting bit of learning for me that I'm picking up from it. Uh, so yeah, thank you. That's, yeah, of course. that's incredible. And it's, it is important that you mention that, Michael, it, it really is. And the reason why is that like, I go back to West Michigan to see my family uh, mm. twice mm. a year predominantly. And yes. you know their lives are pretty much identical today to what they were 30, 40, 50 years ago. Whoa. And so yeah. when you talk about you know conditioning and acculturation, right? everything that 
we are taught, like when we're babies, right, from birth until age six, right, our brain is in the theta brainwave state. And whatever our parents are teaching us, we are just having that baked straight into our subconscious, like our operating system as a human. Yes. And yeah. so then after age seven, we just basically repeat those learned behaviors from our parents and how they acculturated us from birth until age six. So for me, I had to leave Michigan in 2003 in order to start the process of breaking that acculturation. Mm -hmm. And it is now 2021. I'm 41 years of age and I'm still breaking the acculturation 18, 19, 20 years later. Correct. But Correct. when I think about my family back in West Michigan, very little in their lives have changed. They live basically in the same house. They have basically the same friends. Their hobbies are nearly identical. So yeah. when we look at the way that they navigate life and their choices, they are still replicating and reusing the things that their parents taught them you know, yes, quite yes. some time ago. And so for everybody listening or watching, understand that the process of breaking and shedding that acculturation is not simple. It's full of emotion. It's oftentimes very challenging, but it is pretty much your purpose on earth, right? That's pretty much why you're here is to grow and develop and to contribute to the growth and development and the self-actualization of others around you. So this is why souls come to earth is to have this type of growth and learning. It's uncomfortable, but it's the way that we then have success on earth. We find our happiness. We find joy. We connect with our soul at a very deep level. So I just want people to really understand that like success is not power, money, or fame. Mm. That's not what society is designed to be, right? Really, you know, success is a long, happy, and healthy life. And yes. that comes from shedding the acculturation getting to know yourself at a deep level, and then designing habits and routines and rituals that allow for you to spend a disproportionate amount of time living your core values or living your life's mission or doing the things that genuinely bring you joy. Mm. Yeah. And I think that last thing, that, that last bit, what you said about what gives you joy is the thing that most people desire and don't know how to find. And often when we get stuck in, say, corporate life, um, in large organizations where, you know, you were a robot on the farm, but um, people, people were our robots in corporate organizations. And I think we're still in a pandemic, but what the pandemic has taught us with people working from home, not in an organizational building with their tribe, is they've broken that relationship to a certain degree, the energy connection that you get being physically together. And once they've been away from it, they're kind of going, hmm, it feels different here <laughs> yeah. at home yeah. from when I was with people, you know, something's changed and they don't realize it's because the physical energy has been cut and and therefore they're feeling better as a result. I mean, don't get me wrong, not everybody is enjoying working from home. But they want people they want to connect with like minded people. But they weren't always like minded. That's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were there because they they maybe in some ways had to be. And yes, uh, I completely agree with you, Michael, there's this really big transformation that's occurring. And for some of the clients that I have in an executive coaching uh, method, I ask them to sometimes depending on if they're open to it, to while they're sitting in meditation to literally close their eyes and envision that there is a plug coming from one person like an energetic line or cord uh, that you can't see that's connecting them to one other person. And I say in meditation or prayer, while you're sitting down, just metaphysically disconnect it, like unplug it from your stomach. Like this yeah. is a very easy thing to see, but when they do that, they start to see, okay, I'm going to literally in a soul-based manner, in an energy-based manner, I'm going to disconnect from this person's energy. Has yes. it been made simpler over the last 18 months because we're not with people in person? Yes. Mm, yes. But this is also an expedited way to make sure that you're not staying connected to a person who really drags your energy down. Mm, so, mm. so there are those people who want to be able to be together. Of course, we want to be able yeah. to find an appropriate balance for that. 
And I know that you're a a higher I, Michael on the disc, and I'm a high C, right? So I'm the introvert. I'm the... (laughs) I'm the guy who likes to spend time alone or recharge my batteries alone. Right. So right, at right. the end of a, a really long day of coaching or of having awesome conversations like this, I find myself just going into a spare room or an office and just mm-hmm. sitting there quiet and still. But yes, for yes. those folks that have more of a communication style like Michael's, the recharging of the batteries comes from being with people, right? Yes, it comes yes. from being in groups. It comes from conversation. And so that's why I always want to find a balance for the folks that I serve is understanding first, what's their communication style and how do I, after a a long stressful day, how do I make recommendations or suggestions for them that they can recharge their batteries in the way that's really tailored and customized to them because every person's different. And so as we navigate this transformation away from these large corporate hierarchies to places where many of us are in the gig economy or maybe entrepreneurs, we have to be really mindful of what triggers us in negative ways emotionally. We have to be really mindful of what gifts us energy. And then we have yes. to make time for those things day to day to day, because that's the thing that's going to create the joy. That's the thing that's going to create mm-hmm. the happiness is knowing that we were in control. We had freedom to control our own destiny and live life on our terms. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's coming. It's obviously happening right now. It's just in this kind of final stage of releasing Uh, there's a lot of really heavy energy on earth and we have a little bit longer to kind of navigate that. But then after that is released, there's going to be a very utopian world available to us if we choose to go down that path. Yeah. Great. Great. It makes a lot of sense. And it, and it, you know, we will look back at, at the pandemic. Don't get me wrong. There's been a lot of lost lives on earth and that's, you know, really really sad um but there will be when we look back a lot of gifts as well um which will make the earth a different place to live on i mean they've all got to unfold yet (laughs) you know we're still in the middle of crisis and and agony and 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 all of that brilliant michael i i really loved our conversation and you're doing some really amazing work um i wish you so much success with it all i know it will be great and successful um do keep me posted if you are launching circles in the uk whatever i can do to spread the word i'll I'll happily do that um where can people find out about the book about you about executive coaching about circles just share some some uh, locations with with them all yeah, I, I really want to honor and thank you, Michael, it, it, for your time today, but also for for sharing my message because, you know, what, yesterday when I went to your LinkedIn profile just to refresh myself, it's there. There's a very purposeful reason why you've already received 63 LinkedIn recommendations, right? You could there's just an energy <laughs> about you, right? You have a very very good strong energy, which I appreciate, and so I can see how people are attracted to you so strongly. So so thank you for allowing me to share my message, but also thank you for being you and doing the work that you're doing. Like it, it really does matter. And so for me, Thank folks, you. if if you're interested, it's Michael S Siever.com. Two S's in the center. My middle name is Scott. So Michael S Siever.com is a hub of resources around becoming your most authentic self about executive coaching. Uh, there's three online courses there. There's a bunch of free downloads. Um, there's probably 200 plus blogs and articles if that's really interesting to you. So a lot of material there to help a person go from that place of disengagement to that place of clarity. And so I really want that to be a central hub of resources for that. So michaelsiever.com is the best place to be able to see all of those things in one easy to find place. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I'll make sure I'll include the social links as well if they want to follow and whatever else you're writing on a day-to-day basis. Again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And if you ever traveling to London or into the UK, do let me know. Be good to see each other in person. I agree. Uh, But until then, (laughs) it's been great. Thank you so much. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.